Even though it was expected, Bill Peduto's decisive victory as Pittsburgh mayor brings excitement, anticipation for his supporters in the city and throughout the region. Voters overwhelmingly elected this three-term city councilman to mayor, and he brought his victory party here to Homewood. Tonight, Mayor-elect Peduto sits down for a conversation to talk about his top priorities, how he wants to shape the future of this great city. And he's taking your questions too, straight from social media. Conversation at WQED starts now. Okie dokie. Good evening. I'm Michael Bartley. He arrived to his victory party last night in Homewood, walking to the beat of the Westinghouse High School Band. Very exciting. Tonight, newly elected Pittsburgh Mayor Bill Peduto is here with us for a conversation about what he calls the new Pittsburgh. What exactly does that mean? We're also taking your comments and questions from WQED's Twitter and Facebook pages. So log on and get the online conversation going. Mayor-elect Peduto, how does that feel? What about that title? It feels kind of surreal. Uh, so there's like a little bit of a separation still, I think. And it's just been such a long journey and an exhausting ride that at this point, it seems more like, well, we got a lot of work to do. It was really, and I, I have to use the word, this adorable thing. You're coming into the studio and you say, Michael, hold on a second. And you called your mother, <laughs> Eva. She lives in Scott Township and to, to tell her you were going to be on this program. Hello, hello, Eva. Yeah. Uh, well, I saw you last night in Homewood. You look great. Yeah. And she lives in Scott Township yeah. in the house you grew up in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What did that mean? To be with my family, um, we, you know, I'm getting a little emotional about know, it right now. I know. So, yeah, because we lost, you know, my brother and we lost my dad. And mm -hmm. So it was, uh, we all got together in Hazelwood last night. Um, my entire family and my friends who I grew up with since kindergarten and before and their parents that were still alive and we all just sat there had this wonderful meal we were happy and then uh, you know Peduto's don't get too sentimental but we sort of got sentimental and we started thinking about the ones that weren't there mm -hmm. and just the ones that are um, <laughs> there is no politics in my family no one ever imagined this my grandfather came over on a boat with a second grade education settled in Carnegie, there was no way that he was ever saying, my grandson will one day be the mayor of the city. What so did, there was what, a lot of pride. What did your mom say to you? Just now? Just last night? Um, there was no advice or anything of that sort. There, it's it's not the way my family is. We're sort of mm -hmm. quiet. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the only liberal in my family. It's like- <laughs> Is that know, right? Oh yeah, Thanksgiving dinner That must Christmas be some interesting holidays. Very, very much so. My one brother, David's a retired Lieutenant Colonel in the US Army and a mm -hmm. psychologist. My brother Guy runs Inova down in West Virginia, which is like their uh, Pittsburgh Tech Center. Um, and we lost my brother Tom, but the uh, yeah, the family is a conservative, traditional Italian family. So they would have been very happy if I would have chosen not to get involved in politics. It was just something that I, I felt I wanted to do on my own. It's an interesting path as well. Uh, you're a suburban kid. Yeah. Really. I, I, how did that all happen? <laughs> they decided to settle in Scott before I was born. It was uh, none of my decision. But uh, so my family, my dad's side settled in Collier, his uh -huh. family. Collier back, Township. Back mm -hmm. in the 1880s. And um, so the same house that my great grandfather lived in and my grandfather was born in, my dad was born on a Noblestown Road in Walker's Mill. Mm -hmm. My mom's family came over, my grandfather came over in 1921 and settled in Carnegie mm -hmm. and um, so between the Collier and the Carnegie we ended up in Scott but my dad's mom uh, my grandmother Margaret um, she ended up leaving the city to go live in Collier with my grandfather she and her family settled in Homewood mm -hmm. and that's why I was in Homewood last night because that's where that side of my family started I was gonna ask you about that you know a, a lot of people were were talking about that yeah why you chose the location and all that kind of thing and and you also said that it that uh, I think I was watching Channel 2 at 11 o'clock, and, and I believe what you said was that this is the neighborhood that needs the most help. Yeah. So that went into your thinking as well. Well, it's, it's the neighborhood right now that has the most crime, the least amount of economic development, and potentially the most opportunity. So, you know, I saw this exact same thing back in 1995 when I was a staff member to Dan Cohen, mm -hmm. and we started to put together a plan for a neighborhood called East Liberty. Uh, and at that time, that was the drive-by capital. We had a heroin epidemic that was going on, drugs that were being dealt right out of the bars. I remember getting the call from the commander when we were trying to figure out where it was coming from. 
And he said, well, the guy's dead in the bathroom standing up with a needle in his arm. I think we know now where it's coming from. And every business left East Liberty. But over the course of, well, you know, almost 15 years, we were able to create a community plan, get the community behind it, find developers to follow it. Now East Liberty is one of the hottest neighborhoods in the city of Pittsburgh. So are you saying that the next priority, you know, and I, and I got to tell you, I ran into Ricky Burt just last night yeah. at, at, your, at your victory party. And he said, we need $300 million to turn this neighborhood around, to really develop this neighborhood. 300 minimum, I think, is what he said. So can you say after January 6th, when you're sworn in, Homewood is, is, is a significant priority, if not the top priority? Yeah, no, I can say that neighborhoods like Homewood, and Homewood being at that top of that list, it's not just Homewood, it's Lincoln Leamington. It's not just in the East End, it's Sheridan mm -hmm. in the West End. It's Beachview and rebuilding that business district. It's down in Manchester and over in Ch Chateau, which many people don't see is uh, the potential of having riverfront housing because it used to be industrial. All of these neighborhoods have such amazing potential. Mm -hmm. It's right over the hill in Hazelwood, in the El Mono site. Uh, we have the opportunity to rebuild the neighborhoods that built this region. Pittsburgh and its neighborhoods built western Pennsylvania. Now we have to look and refocus inward in order to make it so it's the opposite of Detroit, mm -hmm. a very, very strong urban center that helps to sustain a much strong, stronger region. You know, when, when you took the stage last night, Rich Fitzgerald introduced you and, mm -hmm. and you said from the time of David Lawrence mm -hmm. up to Luke Ravenstall, um, you know, the, the renaissances were going on. And yeah. you said, with, with this election, and, and you win handily, with this election, uh, it's the end of the renaissance. Mm -hmm. And I gotta tell you, um, there were some confused faces with, mm -hmm. uh, with your supporters and so forth. Because I, I even thought to myself, what? Mm -hmm. You know, Pittsburghers love renaissance. Mm -hmm. And so, what exactly did you mean? Is, 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 is the neighborhood priority what, what you mean rather than skyscrapers downtown? So let me explain it to you this All way. Right. So Pittsburgh has gone through, it's going into its fourth transformation. Its first was, it was a frontier town and a fort town. And by the time that Lewis and Clark left here, the west had moved. And then Pittsburgh went into its second phase, which was an industrial town. And we built the west. We were the people that supplied the supplies to build out the rest of this country and we built an entire nation from here. And then at that point, certain leaders understood we couldn't sustain this. So they started looking at new ways in order to reinvent a new Pittsburgh at that time, back in the 1940s. Environmental degradation, um, just disparity between the haves and the have-nots. And they started to put together different plans. Uh, the unions and the mills helped to build out a middle class. Clean air acts and clean water controls were placed. And at the same time, though, the economic model of the Renaissance was big. Big tunnels and bridges that drove people out of the city and into the suburbs, like my family. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the focus on downtown development and big buildings. Uh, even the ideas that we would build convention centers and stadiums and airports and then would tear them down and build convention centers and stadiums and new airports. Mm -hmm. That was the Renaissance model. The new model looks inward. It turns this model that David Lawrence created of a top-down government public partnership and it turns it upside down to empower people in the neighborhoods to be able to say this is what we want to see happen and then government works to enable it. It's exactly what we did in East Liberty. Where I would differ with the Reverend Burgess is there wasn't $300 million on the table when we redid East Liberty. What there was was community will to support and then a partnership with foundations, uh, government, and developers to make it happen. So you believe community will leads to the money? I believe that economic development and especially real estate development runs like a river. And when there's a rock in front of it, where developers or those that are willing to invest feel that there is resistance, it runs around the rock. What we did is we took the rocks out so that East Liberty saw the type of development that it could occur. And if we could do it in East Liberty, we could certainly do it in Sheridan, in Beachview, in Carrick, in Marshall Shadeland, in Lincoln Leamington, and Homewood. And you, but, and you know the research as well as I do about shoring up the core, the core meaning, meaning the city. Are you, are, are you getting along with the developers, the business people, the, the um, 
you know, you mentioned sports teams yeah, a I lot, just, that kind yeah. of thing. And you've been very open about this. Sure. I, it's important to be open. It's important that I plant the flags now and say this is the type of administration you can expect. This will be a transparent administration. I, I just came from the Allegheny Conference annual meeting. I got mm -hmm. a big round of applause from the folks that were there. There was a video that was profiling my desire to see 21st century economic development opportunities go to neighborhoods that have seen no opportunities. And it's a, it's a model that can work. So what I say to people is Pittsburgh is a city that is open for business, but it will no longer be a city that's for sale. And anybody who wants to come in and have an opportunity will be given it, but there won't be special privilege or special rules just because you're bigger or you're more accessible through political uh, channels, but you still foster jobs, foster development for jobs and the whole, all of that to grow all that. Because you said last night from 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 the podium, you know, in, in a certain number of years, you want the population to increase by 20, 30,000. 20, and, and I congratulate you on this. You know, last night at that party in Homewood, and, and I was eyeballing the crowd. It was probably the most diverse crowd of a of a political event, without question. And so, it's been that way for with us. For the past several years, mm -hmm. uh, but you know that was great pride as well. Not just having, it, I was told it was the f first mayoral uh, campaign election night for a primary or a general that's been in a predominantly African American neighborhood, mm -hmm. and that could potentially mean you know, at least for the past 100 years. But 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 you, you're committed to growing jobs and working with business. I want to bring your attention. And I think you said you read you read Joe Mystic's article yeah. on Sunday in the Trib. Joe Mystic, who's an attorney at the Duquesne uh, University Law School, but mm -hmm. he worked for Sophie and did some work for Dick Caligiuri. Somebody who I go to for advice. And and is that okay? Is yeah. that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And he says that you need to get all the developers to weigh in on your vision to cooperate and coordinate with each other. How do you do that? Well, I think Joe said it the way that they used to do it, the way that he did it with Sophie. It's that treasured conference table in the mayor's office when you sit around and you put it and you say look we have these properties in Beachview and we're going to rebuild Broadway Avenue but here's what we need from you in order to be able to do it and you allow the developers then to, who can best come up with the plan that the community wants to see happen have an opportunity to do it and then sometimes there's opportunities to incentivize it sweeten the pot by TIFs or other government grants mm -hmm. but what we're doing is we're saying those types of programs no longer will just go to your building or your project this is the same thing we've told the penguins that we've told uh, Buncher and everyone mm -hmm. that we have got to see that then benefit the area around your development as well because we don't have Elm Street money. Mm -hmm. We don't have Main Street money. Those programs are gone. It's not just development money, it's community money. So, what, so when we use public funds it goes mo to more than just the project itself. Now we probably couldn't have this conversation ten years ago when Tom Murphy was there because this it wasn't as much of a seller's market for the city but it is right now. And there's a lot of people who are coming in who have never come in before. Largest developer of apartments in the Midwest sat down with him about three months ago. I asked him why he had not come to Pittsburgh before. He told me because it was a fixed system. He said, with you, I have faith that it's going to give us an opportunity. I got him in Bloomfield, and in the south side, he's looking to do a second development now. His own analysis has an immediate need for 5,000 new units of apartments in Pittsburgh, not the Western Pennsylvania, the city of Pittsburgh. I'm going to ask you a question. You know, this, there was this whole business with the Penguins, and there was push pull, on, without a doubt, on 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 these plans. Yeah, no, we and were making we were making a statement to the Penguins as well. And there, there was push pull that was it was all through the media and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we read. For uh, months before it got in the media, it was back and forth between us and the Penguins. How intense, and, 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 and the reason I bring this up is that, you know, you're getting a, a lot of credit for hiring a young man by the name of Kevin Acklin. Yeah. There's, there's no question about that. Yeah. You know, uh, an Ivy League attorney, a guy who's, you know, all over the city on, on local boards and Georgetown so forth. Georgetown Law School. Georgetown Law School, the, the, whole, the whole business. It, how impacting has he been? You know, because when I read the, the article about the at least the preliminary talks going very well with the Penguins, that uh, Kevin Acklin is already doing a heck of a job. So let me explain something. For uh, ten years, I had the best chief of staff in all of government, a guy named Dan Gilman, who we're now soon going to call council. Councilman mm -hmm. Gilman, and I'm sure one day we'll call either Congressman or Senator Gilman, and I believe that 100%. He got me here. I've been very blessed to have worked with him. 
I have um, somebody who will be my chief of staff and my chief development officer, Kevin Acklin, who I met playing pickup hockey at Shenley Ice Rink Sunday nights at 9 to 11. And let me tell you, Kevin Acklin not only is a Harvard grad who graduated top of his class and then went on to Georgetown Law, but he also left, led Central Catholic Vikings in penalty minutes for four straight years on their hockey team. So he's a guy who knows how to get in the corners when he needs to and protect his, his other players. Um, Kevin has had weekly meetings with the Penguins, mm -hmm. working through all the details. He is trained in mediation uh, at the top level and he just is very pragmatic and fights for what he believes is the right thing. We work together because we think very much alike. We're both progressives out of the old school Teddy Roosevelt progressive ideals. And um, he has a life-size painting of Teddy Roosevelt in his home. But the, the other thing with the Penguins is, it wasn't that we were trying to stop the development. We wanted the development to occur so that it would help more than just the 28 acres, that it would help the part of the hill in the lower hill that then would make development in the middle hill much more attractive. Mm -hmm. The infrastructure and the improvements that were needed. We wanted to take the politics out because so many times in the hill district it depends on whose political side you're on, whether you have a seat at the table or not, and bring everyone to the table. And we wanted to limit the need for public investment in the future by basically saying if we give you this now then that will limit what we can give you later on because we have so much need throughout the city. Point one, point two, point three, mm -hmm. all three points we're now working with the Penguins we're, on. We're getting a lot of tweets here tonight and I'm yeah. going to get to them in just a moment, but you're 49. You just turned 49. Just turned, for happy birthday. 48 just in a week. For, just turned, for, yeah, exactly. <laughs> is, I'm uh, grudgingly getting to 50 and it's, it's slow. Is it, is it true that you, you may you know, because you could be mayor of Pittsburgh for a long time. You're a young guy. Will you limit yourself? I, I think the job limits. Self-imposed term limits, you do well, what you do. I mean, do. there was no reason for me to stay another day in city council. After 12 years, you sort of have an opportunity to do all the things you want to do. Sure, I could write a couple more bills. I could take on a couple more issues. But you know what, it's, it's, it's time for somebody else. Gilman is going to knock it out of the park. I, mm -hmm. I live in the district, I'm happy he's going to be my councilman. But um, I, I, I guess I look at any government office, it's, it's as long as the public wants you there, but at the same time, you also have to be r cognizant that there could be somebody better than you that's mm -hmm. coming down the road. So I, I told, we're going to make a big announcement tomorrow of uh, the new executive officers of the city of Pittsburgh. I jokingly refer to it as Kevin plus seven. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll announce, well, we've already announced Kevin, but six of them. Mm -hmm. uh, we won't be announcing a new public safety director Can yet. you tell us who they are? Not yet. No, the people will be okay. announced tomorrow. And, uh, okay. but, uh, we're going to have a profile and a, there will be a, a lot of information for the public that will go out with it, not just a name. But, um, you know, I've told them, you, this is a job for four years. And there is no guarantee after that that you have a job and to all the city employees now that serve in the director's positions and other at-will positions, it's only uh, on a four-year four term. I mean, you, there's no guarantee that you're going to be back there for year five. So. How about you? How long for you? Well, as long as the people will let me do it. Okay. I, uh, all right. This is it for me politically, though. Mm -hmm. I have no desire to go to Harrisburg. Uh, I used to work in Harrisburg. Washington. Why would I want to be one of 435 people, Fighting. especially in a minority, so that mm -hmm. I may be able to get enough money to build a ball field? Right. You know, the mayor, of an American city has got to be one of the greatest jobs on earth, the mayor of Pittsburgh. This is the greatest city in America. And it's, 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 to me, it's my dream. Absolutely. That's, there's no other job that will ever come this, to this level. You are, you're, a, you're a social media mayor as well, so I'm going to get to Huge. some tweets here. Ready? Yes. Uh, Carla's asking, uh, I believe on Twitter, uh, what are your plans for education in Pittsburgh? What about that? That's a great question, Carla, and, and we appreciate that. You know, are, are you going to you know, follow with this order of Luke Ravenstahl as it relates to the Pittsburgh Promise. Sure, with the Promise, but I'm going to be even more involved in that. What so, does that mean? Well, I met with Linda Lane last week, and Dr. Lane, you know, is going to need some help. Um, there's, there are two issues coming up. 2015, we have the contract with the teachers' union, 
And we haven't seen a strike in this town for quite a long time, and I don't want to see a strike in this town. Not while I'm there, and I'm going to do everything I can to help to mediate any differences that we have in order to be able to, to make sure we get to peace. Will you continue the, the pressure on UPMC as it relates to nonprofit status? Yes. The, 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 the current mayor's. Yes. I mean, with a lawsuit on the table, it, it provides us some leverage, but at the same time, it's also asking. Uh, to make sure that UPMC is following the law for mm -hmm. purely public charities. Okay, we have a transportation question. How will you improve reliability utilization of public transportation? That's a great question. I was in Harrisburg uh, two weeks ago to lobby for the transportation bill. What I was doing though is kind of different. I wasn't telling our elected leaders what they had to do. I was asking them what I could do. Same thing with what I'm talking about with Linda Lane. There's an opportunity there for a mayor to help to mediate these types of differences. Mm -hmm and especially when it's coming from western Pennsylvania where there's two sides that have dug in heels and are being divisive, uh, mayor has the opportunity to sort of partnering with the county executive and other elected officials be able to put things on the table to try and get there. So we need a dedicated source of revenue, this transportation bill would have it, and then we want to look and Rich Fitzgerald and I are both backing a bus rapid transit system to connect our two largest employment centers downtown in Oakland, but stopping in the hill and uptown to create transit-oriented development for those neighborhoods as well. So we'll see a lot of sort of these regional efforts because of your relationship with Rich Fitzgerald, and you and I have both known him for many, many years. I talk to him more than I talk to my own family. What do you say to people then that, 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 that say, you know, when he introduced you last night, he emceed the whole deal. Mm -hmm. What do you say to people, Bill, who say he, that this mayor's too close to the county executive? I say that's, the, <laughs> we need a mayor who's very close to the county executive. I voted and worked for the uh, referendum in order to create a county executive system so that we have one person who's looking over the big things. So, you know, whether it's transportation or workforce development, economic development, and then you need a mayor who concentrates back on that little part, 25% of Allegheny County, the city, to make sure that it is as strong as possible. There's a partnership and an understanding. We don't agree on every issue, mm -hmm. and we're not going to. But we have enough respect for one another that when we do disagree, we don't blow it up in the papers or we don't, you know, try to, to put either one of us in a position which is uncomfortable. We haven't had that. The, 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 the big projects that happened in the mid-90s when we were down on our knees economically were happening when Cramner and DeWita and Murphy decided to form their coalition and, and started to work with Governor Ridge. We already have it now with Rich and I. Uh, to be able to work off of one sheet of paper and to create one economic development strategy for this city and this region. And uh, that's going to be a great benefit. And given last night's election results, you'll have a coalition on council, will you not? Yeah. Yeah, we got some really Natalia great people. Natalia Rudiak wins, Dan Gilman wins. Deb Gross. Uh, so you, you, you'll, I don't know, is it accurate to say you'll have a majority? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, I, the, you know, if there are three members or, you know, you could count the, that may be not supportive right now. Mm -hmm. um, I've been having uh, discussions with them and at least one of them that I'll be having a sit down with as well. My goal is to have uh, nine members of council who are going to support a new agenda mm -hmm. uh, by January 6th. We only have a couple minutes left and this goes so fast, but I wanted to get this in. I know you mentioned this today. You and Kevin Ackland mentioned today to, to preserve the Act 47, the fiscal oversight, why is that? Well, because what is not, it, what is, how, how does that benefit a new Pittsburgh? Yeah, so because we're not out of financial woods yet. When we're looking long-term of how we're going to get financially solvent, we have to have a new agreement, a long-term agreement with our nonprofits, which means that it has to be much more of a contribution that has been given in the past for a much longer time period and a commitment to do that. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to basically get to 2018 when our debt structure falls dramatically. So we're putting about $90 million a year just to pay old debt, because that's how we solved the problems in the past. We borrowed. Mm -hmm. By the time we get to 2018, that drops to about $50 million. Mm -hmm. We're then going to have a cushion to stabilize our pension funds and other obligations that we have. But if we don't get to 2018, if we don't have that tool of Act 47, which is fiscal discipline, mm -hmm. and we fail to get there and we borrow money in the years, and then that debt starts to rise again, we're just going to basically keep our head above the water for the next 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. We won't be back under financial distress, but we'll never have the opportunity to see the investment in capital that we need to see, solving our pension crisis, and dealing with our long-term debt problem in a very proactive way. We have 2014 to 2018, just a four-year period. We can do it. 
but we need the, 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 the controls that Act 47 confines us to on spending in order to be able to make it to that point. Congratulations. Thank you, Michael. You be, absolutely, I hope you come back and talk oh, more about this. Of course. Is, I know it goes so fast. And it we does. Have, we had so much more to get Let's to. Let's sit for another half hour. We'll do, we'll do it. Well, actually, we'll do it. Let's we'll just, just yeah, blow, we'll blow out the programming. Exactly. Bill, thanks so much. Congratulations. Thank Don't you. leave here. because no. Before we go, I want to call your attention, all of your attention, to a new WQED documentary. It's getting national attention. It airs tomorrow night at 8. It's the little-known story of a Pittsburgh artist who courageously traveled through the European battleground during World War II. A footlocker arrived that contained tremendous artifacts about my mother. She was a Pittsburgh artist who sketched hundreds of soldiers during World War II. To these men, it was an opportunity to reach back home. This is the story of her sacrifice and spirit, a son's journey to find the people she touched. That's it. <laughs> 1944. Portraits for the home front. The story of Elizabeth Black, Thursday night at 8 on WQED. There's plenty more information about this program. You'll find it, including an eye-opening gallery of soldier sketches, wqed.org slash Elizabeth Black and Bill. We have a lot of veterans in this city and this we county do. as well. No and doubt about it. So Friday, December 6th, we'll be dedicating the new World War II Memorial. My Uncle Marino fought mm -hmm. in World War II. So many family members, and there's still a lot of folks that are still here. We'll be celebrating that. And then we want to look to bring veterans back to Pittsburgh and combine education and workforce training mm -hmm. along with housing and create Operation Black and Gold Ribbon. Black and Gold Ribbon. Okay, we'll hear more about that. Bill Peduto, thank you again. Congratulations. By the way, next time on Conversation at WQED, she's a local CEO whose work has been recognized by two presidents. Joyce Bender and her employees at Bender Consulting Services are making a difference every day, connecting qualified people who are living with disabilities with jobs. Joyce herself sits down for a conversation Wednesday night, 7.30. For now, for Bill Peduto, the mayor-elect, big shot, mayor. I'm Michael Bartley. Mayor, that's all, I'll just say mayor. Mayor. Yeah, mayor. One syllable. Mayor, yeah, you mayor Peduto. Yep. For Bill Peduto, I'm Michael Bartley. Thank you so much. I, you got the accent mayor. on mayor. Yeah, yeah. mayor. Oh, man, it's amazing how fast this show goes. Yeah. You know, yeah. it really does. I'm, 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 I'm,